So yeah, we, we just covered your sort of philosophy of aesthetics and the new realism that you'll be bringing, but what about the ideas behind the actual movie? Is there anything new there? <clears throat> well, the first thing I would What's say is I don't, I don't too? have... People often think, you built the eye to make this one documentary. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, I built the eye because it's like a different kind of camera. So it's like, it's almost as if I invented a steady cam. They go, what's the one movie that you made that steady cam to do? And I'm like, well, I'm going to shoot lots of different things. Mm -hmm. um, the truth is that when you're pitching films, uh, you have to have, you know, five or six different films you're pitching. Otherwise, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. But the, the themes, and, and if you pitch to Discovery, channel that's a different film than with the national film board which is more of an artistic auteur thing Absolutely. but there are some common themes in all these pitches i have uh one of them is is the film aesthetic thing i was talking about mm -hmm. um another one is concerns people have about surveillance which i was talking about briefly um you know are so we afraid of, of privacy and stuff here or are we are we more afraid of of people doing this to us, you yeah. know, when we're drunk at the office party and putting it on YouTube, which, which is scarier. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of power dynamics with video, like uh, the guy at the airport, a uh, Polish fellow who was tased to death. The video of that, those cops doing that didn't come from the airport security cameras. No one's ever seen that footage. The footage that people saw was from a guy's cell phone. Absolutely. And, but that doesn't mean that all people with cell phones are good guys. A lot of them are, are using it to do upskirt videos or mm -hmm. to, uh, to try to catch somebody in an embarrassing situation. Or those kids that, that videotaped, uh, they got control of a kid's webcam and, and made fun of him for being gay and having a friend over at the room and he ended up killing himself. So it's just, it's just information. And, uh... I do think, though, when people have their own video version of the world, it gives them access to information and power that they wouldn't otherwise have. Uh, so there's, there's surveillance, but there's, so there's film language, surveillance issues, which are, are many, um, but also the earlier idea, I was talking about Pimp My Gimp. Mm -hmm. uh, there is one film pitch I'm doing that involves me uh, meeting people like myself. Uh, for example, there's a, there's a very uh, uh, cool fellow in Finland, Jerry, uh, I forget his last name, who, who lost his finger. So he replaced it with a USB uh, key. And, you know, I want to go out with this guy, for example, and shoot a scene where he takes off his USB finger, but I give him a microphone finger. So I've got a camera eye, and he's the sound guy with his microphone finger. That's brilliant. <laughs> and so when you shoot a scene like that, first of all, it's kind of funny, which is my style. Um, is his sound going to be any different than somebody holding a microphone? No. But the fact that he's got a finger microphone and I've got a camera eye, that's, that's entertainment. Uh, but it also makes you think about the body and, and the way things are changing and technology and, and hell, the singularity. So following the Pimp My Gimp line here, how far are you willing to take this? I mean, assuming that technology advances the way it does in, in say, four or five or ten years, at some point soon enough, there would be much more powerful, much more sophisticated and advanced prosthetic eyes with, say, X-ray yeah. vision, Superman vision, uh, ultraviolet uh -huh. vision, you name it. Yeah. Would you want to have and would you use one of those when it comes and how far are you willing to take this? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I'm willing to take it, uh, you know, as, as far as it can go. I mean, unlike you puny humans... <laughs> I can uh, upgrade my eye, and why wouldn't I? Um, what I'm not willing to do, I guess, is, is invasive surgery um, or something like that. But I basically have a space that I can keep working with. 
and and I think people who have lost parts of their body, there's nothing there anymore. So to just attach increasingly high tech equipment, why not? Okay, um, let me ask you this yeah. then: If there comes a point in which your prosthetic eye is many times better than your real eye, would you want yeah. to replace your real eye with a super advanced prosthetic eye? No, um, because I mean. Even the Bionic Man, right from the Six Million Dollar Man show, mm -hmm. he kept one human eye, and then the other eye he could just access for super high tech stuff. Um, but you know, I don't think I don't think that's the way things are going to go. If if anything, um, you know, it's going to be it's not going to be bits and pieces of, of technology. It's going to be bioengineering. Oh, you think so? Cell, cell regeneration or, or DNA manipulation or something like that. I was interviewing Kevin Warwick here a few weeks ago or maybe a couple of months ago, and he thinks that it may go the way of the cyborgization of the human body. I mean, he was the one who underwent a bunch of surgeries to do a bunch of right. different kinds of experiments, such as yeah. hooking up his nervous system to the internet and then to his wife across the ocean and sort of telegraphically uh, communicating with his wife over the internet and stuff like that, right? And turning yeah. on and off a light yeah. bulb with uh, his hand moving yeah. up a robotic hand and all kinds of things like that. So you don't think that's that's right. one potential for our future? And you I don't think see there's yourself be as the forerunner of that. of that tendency? Yeah. I definitely think there's going to be some of that, but... Um like, let's say, for example, you are paralyzed. Mm -hmm. You could get an Iron Man suit, or you could use stem cells to rebuild your spine. Or um, you can create a total new sp spine from super advanced technologies, which is not as fragile as the one that you lost. Right. I, which one would be safer? I mean... Yeah, it's. I think that, you know, we're... We're still a ways off from, you know, becoming like the Borg. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we're, there's a lot of history to us being fleshy creatures and, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, we like to have sex with soft parts and, you know, fleshy bits still. It's <laughs> not quite there yet where, um, although some people do fetishize the whole <laughs> uh, bionic bits. I think it's going to be both, but in general, I think that the post-human is going to be more bioengineered, like with a greater lung capacity mm -hmm. and all this stuff, not through iron lungs, but through, through bioengineering, as I'm saying, where you, you increase your cell capacity. It's almost like ster steroids or stuff like that. Yeah, I see. Uh, um, for the near future, yeah. Let, let me ask you this then, uh, what about the Iborg name, the Iborg alias, how did you come up with that and was it original or did you adopt it from somewhere? Um, it's just one of those words that's kicking around. Um, did you call yourself the Iborg or somebody else did first? Uh, some people were calling me that, a lot of people were calling me different things, but a few people called me Iborg, and um, eventually, like, yeah, I, I had to call myself that in an official marketing way. But, you know, I started a website called Iborg Project, so, mm -hmm. so essentially it was me, but it, it's a word, I mean, cyborg, I, um, it's used to describe uh, various people that have been, you know, wearing cameras and their glasses and stuff like this. So. I see. Uh, yeah. Just as a, as a funny side note, I actually just watched, a, a, I think it's a movie made for TV uh, called The Iborgs. Have you seen it by any yeah. chance? <laughs> so I what have. What do you think I... of that? It, it represents basically uh, what's called an Odin Optical Defense Intelligence Network. Uh, yeah consisting of a number of robotized uh, 
cameras or webcams connected in that yeah. network that are basically taking over the world and running humanity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what do you think? No, of I know that? those guys. Yeah. I uh, um yeah, they were very concerned at one point that um I was going to ruin their film by diluting their brand. Uh I had uh I had never heard of their film, um, but they had heard of me because I'm really good at getting press. Mm -hmm. uh, but we worked out. I was like, look, you know, instead of giving me a hard time, why don't you let me advertise your film? So I put their trailer on my web page. I see. Uh, this first thing you'd see uh, when you went to my website for a long time was their trailer. They ended up getting more press uh, for their film. For me, even if there was, I think it just annoyed them that they'd say, "Hey, we've got this great film called Eyeborgs." So they go, "Oh, are you the Canadian filmmaker from Canada that you know with the eye?" And they're like, "No, no, it's our the film that they." And they, to be fair, they had been working on it, um, obviously before I started getting a lot of press. But um, it all worked out in the end, and it, it's funny; they're actually very similar themes, I guess. In their own in their own way, um, you know, they're doing a dark film about the, the the possibilities of surveillance and robots and artificial intelligence, and it's it's kind of the same theme with all this science fiction stuff. It's there's a future where we lose our privacy uh, and the robots take over and Skynet comes and it's all going to be very scary. Yeah, that's that's basically the the singularity scenario gone bad. Uh, yeah, how? Like, first of all, let me ask you this. Do you believe in the singularity as a potential future of ours or one of the many potential scenarios for our future? Yeah. I mean, I think there's more than one version of, of the singularity, but um, I do think that there's a lot of guys out there who have this number uh, you know, what is it, 40 years from now? The Some say 2029, some say the mid-2040s, right. 2050. That, yeah, and so the idea being that <clears throat> computers will be intelligent enough at that point to consistently repair the body enough so that more or less we might become immortal every time your, your cells age or have a problem the computer will figure out a way to reverse the aging or, or something like this. That seems a little convenient to me because most of the guys pitching that idea, it'd be right before they would die. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, you know, it's kind of convenient that that's the time when, um, you know, because people don't want to die. So well, uh, there's two issues here. One of them is the time frame issue, absolutely. Yeah. But the other issue is just the, the plausibility of that that potential outcome right so if we put away the timeline right right you think that's a possible outcome i mean imagine yourself 40 or 50 years ago and yeah. telling people that you can replace your eye with a camera like people would say that's right. absolutely impossible right maybe well, i guess not what, 50 what years ago you, 100 yeah right i mean of, of course i think that i mean even now you could say we're we're post-human like when you compare us to, like one of the one of the the criteria for being a cyborg, according to some people, is is clothing, because it's technology that is significantly altered mm -hmm. the naked human animal. People go, well, clothing's not, you know. So it, what what is the benchmark test for when we're from human to post-human? What I do agree with is that it's accelerating. So, but just because it's happening faster doesn't mean there's this one specific cutoff point that now the singularity has arrived. You know, and we, we do have artificial intelligence now. Well, I guess what is the, the real question is the question that are computers going to sort of one day become self-aware uh, and, and that's the benchmark or, or there's going to be human beings who have reached a point where they're, they're that much different now.